Hello, my name is Jennifer Stransko and I'm the Physician Engagement Associate for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at HealthPoint Midway for hosting today's session, Vaginitis Diagnosis and Treatment, Dr. Joan Lister. Dr. Lister began her career working in an HMO in the Boston area and then spent two years focusing on OBGYN ultrasound. For nearly 30 years, she practiced OBGYN in small town in Western Massachusetts. She's helped train pre-medical students, medical students, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. After retiring in 2017, she began volunteering in a health safety net clinic. In the past year, she's been providing office GYN care part-time to help her previous practice meet patient needs. Okay, hello everybody. Um, so as we get started, this is the topic we're talking about today. Okay, and how come it's not working for me? There we go. I have no disclosures, um, and you know about the accreditation. These are the goals of the talk. I want you to be able to understand how to evaluate bubble vaginal complaints and know how to recognize and treat all types of uncomplicated vaginitis um, and to appreciate the complexity of complicated recurrent disease and its management. I would like to say on that score, some of these slides have a lot of specifics on one small slide. And I would encourage you, if you're interested, just to print those out and keep them as a cheat sheet. You won't be able to remember them as they go by you in this talk. Now, I understand from Lisa that you guys do have um, a great protocol for looking through a microscope um, when you're evaluating people with vaginitis, and I think that's great. So I did include a few slides like that. So vaginitis, what causes it? Bacterial vaginosis, most common. We all think, you know, vaginitis, okay, that's yeast, but the most common is bacterial vaginosis. Then, veg, uh, then yeast, then trichomoniasis, and then other things uh, which cause itching, burning, and discharge. So we're going to start with giving you three scenarios that I would be willing to bet all of you have seen, if not this month, certainly in the past year. The first is it's 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. You have eight patients to the see, and you get a phone call from a 26-year-old established patient who says she has itchy vaginal discharge. Question being, what do you do? Next, an off you have an office visit with a 36-year-old patient who is um, new to you but she has been treated multiple times for vaginitis, many times with antifungal medication, either over-the-counter or prescription, without an exam or lab evaluation. And now she has a malodorous discharge present for two weeks, and she's tried Monistat 1 with no success. And finally, you're just starting your day and you get a phone call from a 51-year-old you've never seen um, complaining of vaginal discharge, dysuria, dyspareunia, all for two months. So if you just kind of keep these in the back of your mind and think about what you would do as we go through this talk. The options would include take a history, do an exam, do a wet prep and or pH, and then send a vaginitis panel, that would be either the um, nucleic acid amplification testing or the PCR testing, send a vaginal culture, do a test for gonorrhea and chlamydia, have the patient self-collect um, a vaginitis panel, um, that that would be one that covers yeast, uh, bacterial vaginosis, and trichomoniasis. Or finally, you can treat presumptively or schedule an appointment for evaluation in person. So you got to think which of these things would you do or not do? And I should add at the end other, because there's some things I thought of afterwards maybe I would do. So I always think you want to start with history. 
Um, I was always taught that 90% of the time you should get your diagnosis from the history. So for this problem, you want to know about the discharge, um, how much is there, what color is it, what consistency is it, do, does the patient have itching, burning, or pain, either with intercourse or with urination, does it have any odor, and is there any blood with it? You want to know how long it's lasted and what over-the-counter treatments people have tried. Then you want to know the history enough to know if they've been treated before for similar complaints and what the um, treatments have been. Finally, include just a little bit about sexual history, menstrual history, and contraception. Then the second thing would be an exam. So you're looking first at the vulva because there are other things that cause itching and pain on the vulva. And those would include lichen sclerosis edotrophicus. You probably have all seen that with the kind of whitish, um, thin, um, dry areas um, of the labia minora usually and uh, the introitus psoriasis, which is more patchy red, and um, other dermatoses that can occur on the vulva. Um, when you're going to look in the vagina, if you can, if it's well tolerated, try not to use lubricant, just warm water on your speculum. And um, just get a little bit of the discharge, put it on a pH paper, know what that is, and then set up for a wet prep. Finally, um, I always collect a sample for um, either DNA or PCR testing and or STI testing. I may not send them, but I have them if I want them. So you, it sounds like you guys all know how to do a wet prep. Um, putting a little bit of discharge in, on pH paper and on two places on slides, adding saline to one and KOH to the other. KOH to give you that very distinctive odor when you have BV. Um, and then you can look at both samples under the microscope. Um, after that, you can decide whether or not you need to send the other testing to the lab. So I have a few microscopic um, pictures just to review what you're likely to see. This is one of yeast seen under a KOH prep showing both the hyphae and the spores. And then with bacterial vaginosis, you're gonna see um, some vulvar erythema, thin gray-white discharge, pH is high, WIF, WIF test is positive, then you see clue cells under the microscope. Um, and that that um, is uh, when the edges of the epithelial cells, which should be very distinct and sharp, like you see in the picture on the left, are instead very irregular, almost like what they call a popcorn appearance. Um, and that's all little organisms stuck in the edges of the cells. Um, for trick, um, th this is what you see grossly, moderate, um, erythema, a little bit of yellowish discharge, these kind of um, strawberry uh, red uh, spots on the cervix, again, a high pH, but a whiff test that's negative. And most gynecologists just love trick because it's so fun to see these little guys wiggling around on your slide. And then you know you have the diagnosis. For atrophic vaginitis, when you put that speculum in, you're going to see this kind of an appearance to the vaginal wall. It's thin, it has no rugae, and um, it just looks kind of inflamed in some places and atrophic in others. Um, finally, this is a prep for um, on saline for disquamative inflammatory vaginitis. It really looks pretty much the same as atrophic vaginitis would look. You see lots and lots of white blood cells and um, parabasal vaginal cells just covering the slide. And you should not be seeing yeast and uh, trichomonads and things like that on a slide like this. Okay, so we're gonna start with yeast because 
that's the one we all think of when we think of vaginitis. Um, the history is of um, itching and sometimes um, pain with urination, pains with intercourse. They don't have to have all these things, but they'll have at least one or two. On exam, you find white discharge can be thick, can be chunky, can be watery, can be very scant, but some discharge. Negative whiff test and erythema is not a big part of this one. Um, but you can see some swelling, you can see some fissures and excoriations all on the outside. Okay, let's see if I can get this. All right. Under the microscope on the KOH side, you'll see the hyphae and or spores in a little less than half of the people. Um, well, a little less than half will have both. Some will have just spores, some will have just hyphae. And um, if you do send the molecular test in, it will show yeast. And I would not bother sending a culture unless it, you're in the uh, situation of recurrent vaginitis. So the other thing to keep in mind is that yeast colonization is extremely common. So they say up to 70% of women will have colonization sometime during the year. Um, and that it, it's more in pregnant at any particular time that be more pregnant women than non-pregnant women who will be colonized. Um, so the symptoms of yeast vaginitis are, are caused by the immune reaction to the organism. It's not the organism itself. And if you get the organism um, as an innocent bystander and something else you're doing, pap smear or whatever, you should ignore that. So um, the actual infection with symptoms is going, going to occur at least once in the majority of women. And then it recurs frequently in this small minority, which will they will take up more of your time than anybody else. Most of the time, it's candida albicans, 90% of the time. Uh, most of the remaining 10% will be uh, Candida glabrata, which is more common in Asia and Africa. Also more common in older women and those with predisposing factors like diabetes, HIV, or recurrent uh, disease. Um, these are the things that increase the likelihood of having symptomatic yeast vaginitis. I think you probably know most of these um, antibiotics because they uh, mess with the um, the flora of the vagina, pregnancy, obesity, diabetes, immunosuppression with and or HIV, and um, hormone therapy, especially with uh, vaginal estrogen. So these are the treatments for uncomplicated yeast. I'm not going to go through them individually. I'm sure you all know them. Um, but, um, I'm going to go back one minute here. Um, and that may be coming. You can treat vulvar symptoms, um, specifically by instructing your patient to make a little mixture of an antifungal like clotrimazole and a steroid, um, ointment or cream, um, hydrocortisone or triamcinolone, just mix a dime size bit on their fingertip and apply it, um, you know, one, two, three times a day, just to the itchy part of the vulva. The trick is though, if you do that, you also have to be giving them something to treat disease in the vagina because you'll never get rid of it just treating the vulva. Um, it isn't considered an STI, but sometimes male partners do develop rash and irritation. And in that case, you can treat them with topical medication or with a diflucan. You don't treat men if they don't have symptoms. Um, during pregnancy, um, you should be using the topical azole because uh, fluconazole um, 
has been linked to increased uh, miscarriage risk. Um, so there's one prescription azole and a couple over-the-counter ones um, that you can use. Um, be aware that the over-the-counter ones that come as uh, a one-day, three-day, or seven-day treatments, one day sounds so appealing, but it's very potent and it causes a lot of burning and itching as a side effect. So it's hard to know if you're really clearing up the problem because the side effect of the medication is so pronounced. Now, you know, people have said these, these are the old wives tales that we've heard for many decades um, of using cotton underwear, prolong, avoiding prolonged uh, time in a wet bathing suit and being careful how you wash your genitals. I don't think there's anything good in the literature to support this, but if people want to do it, there's no harm in these things. Now, the tricky part gets to when you have complicated yeast. That is defined as um, episodes occurring four or more times a year. Um, uh, infection with a non-albicans form of candida. And that's, uh, as I said before, candida glabrata, cruciae, or parasilosis. And these occur in up to 10% of women. The, with the last one there, the symptoms will often persist after the organism has been eradicated because we're talking about uh, immune reaction causing the symptoms that doesn't die down so quickly with that organism. Um, you can also count a, a particularly um, severe set of symptoms or findings as a complicated infection. And similarly, if you give um, people uh, what should be an effective uh, treatment for one to seven days and they don't get better, they're back to see you within a week or two, um, that too I would consider complicated yeast. Um, there's a lot of different um, protocols for treating this. And I'm going to throw out some of them. This is one of those slides I would print because I can never keep it in my head myself. But the easiest one is to start by giving flu uh, fluconazole um, daily for two or three, every three days for two or three doses. And, and some people will come in and tell you that's what they need to say. Got to have two doses, never gets better with one. Might as well just start there. It's fine. Um, if they're coming back, then I would do a culture. And you have to ask for yeast culture. And you have to say that you want sensitivities. Um, that's good for picking up the non-albicans um, forms of yeast. And also, also for making sure you are eradicating it. Um, for more difficult infections, you can continue the fluconazole uh, once a week for six months, and that works pretty well while they're taking it. The problem is that when you stop, up to 50% of people will get symptoms again. And for those people, it's particularly important to get a culture and sensitivity, um, and if uh, you get sensitivity to fluconazole and you have a candida albicans organism, um, then just put them back on the weekly um, fluconazole. Now, another way to approach it is to use either myconazole cream or clotrimazole cream, cream uh, for two weeks and then twice a week for six months. Um, an alternative would be boric acid capsules, 600 milligrams. They're available at uh, Walmart and almost everywhere these days. I think you can probably get them on Amazon. Um, and they work really well. You use them nightly for 14 days um, with very good results, but you have to be sure to tell people not to let children get at them and nobody gets them by mouth because they're very toxic that way. Um, some people also still use Nystatin suppositories nightly for two weeks, um, particularly while they're waiting for a, a culture result. 
Now, if you have Candida glabrata, then the boric acid is particularly useful. Nystatin is felt by some people to be effective. And uh, fluconazole at a higher dose, twice a week for a month, can sometimes also work. But the azoles and the fluconazole are really only about 50% effective. And I have had little trouble and some really pretty good results using boric acid. Uh, Candida crucii is usually resistant to fluconazole, but sensitive to the topical azoles. So you use it for a week or two. Um, a second line oral treatment would be with ke ketoconazole or itronic, it, I can't even say all these, itraconazole. And again, um, for one to, one to two weeks. Dr. Lister, we do have a couple questions. Good. Let's, this is a good place to stop. Okay. Yeast. Um, what's your practice for treating yeast vaginitis in pregnancy, i.e. oral versus vaginal? Um, let's see. Let's go back to that one. I think I have that here. Here we go. Um, there really isn't much you can do oral during pregnancy. Um, so I think you have to pick, I usually use terconazole, but really any of the, any of the over-the-counter ones are okay to use in pregnancy. And I think if you're getting complicated recurrent infections in pregnancy, you just make up some reg regimen of how you're going to do this. Like maybe you're going to do a week and if symptoms are gone, you're gonna to go to twice a week for a month or two or three. And then maybe you're gonna to go to once a week, again for a month, two or three, taper off slowly. And until they deliver, I get. To, I guess you could say, well, there's no risk of mis miscarriage late in pregnancy, but I think I would not use fluconazole in pregnancy. The next question. The next yeah. question is, what treatment would you recommend for PTS with recurrent infections that are actively trying to get pregnant? If they're actively trying to get pregnant, again, I would use the um, topical ones that we talked about for pregnancy because you're not really going to know um, are they pregnant or not unless if you've seen somebody shortly after their period. Sure, I would give them the Diflucan and not worry about it at all. Um, I wouldn't do the repeated um, Diflucan for a complicated yeast. I would go with, um, you could go with one of these guys for a complicated yeast. I think you can use boric acid too. Um, while somebody's trying to get pregnant, but it's it, that could get in the way. I'd worry about that getting in the way of um, good, um, healthy sperm and sperm motility. So I probably wouldn't do that in luteal phase either. Um, it's tough when people when people are trying to get pregnant. It's the hardest time. So if they're not, if you're able to control to get rid of the the infection, that's the best. Um, if you're not, try to do your treatments right after their period um, when they're not going to conceive anyway. Okay, do you have another one there? No, that was it. Okay, on to bacterial vaginosis. Um, this is the most common cause of vaginal discharge in reproductive age women. And it is... Um, pretty common, especially in high risk groups, up to 60%. These are the risk factors. It seems like everybody would have at least one of these, but um, you can kind of look them over. And um, if some of these you have control over and some you don't, and you would be anyway advising people to stop smoking and to control their weight. So if it helps to say, and your bacterial vaginosis is less likely to come back, um, you can do that. 
Um, the history is usually, it may or may not have much discharge. It does have itching and malodor. Those are the things people complain about. On the exam, the discharge, if it's there, is watery, kind of grayish, a little bit um, bubbly. And the most uh, in, <clears throat> distinctive thing is, is the fishy malodor. <clears throat> in fact, I think in the um, diagnosis book, that's the diagnosis is like fishy malodor syndrome or something. Um, the pH is high, with test is positive, and you will see clue cells. Um, you can have co-infection with yeast, but if you don't, you won't see the rods. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. You won't see the um, hyphae or the spores. And of course you won't see rods because the um, bioflora flora is disrupted with this disease. Um, you can confirm it with one of the molecular tests, but don't, um, confuse a PAP report with a diagnosis because the uh, cytologists often call um, uh, organisms, con organisms consistent with bacterial vaginosis, but the um, reliability of that is very poor. Now, women who are in relationships uh, with other women often share this uh, disease. 90% of partners will test positive. And um, flip side of that is 90% of um, partners of women who test negative, they will also be negative. So they don't recommend evaluating and treating the partner the first time round. But if you have recurrent BV, then that should be done. Um, BV is kind of a nasty infection because it has um, a bad impact on lots of GYN conditions. Um, it is associated with PID and endometritis. It causes these obstetric issues to be increased, infertility, spontaneous abortion, preterm birth. It causes infections after abortion, after DNC, after hysterectomy, and it increases the risk that people pick up another uh, infection. HIV, the transmission is way up. Um, the acquisition is also up somewhat. Um, acquisition of um, herpes and human papillomavirus, chlamydia and trick, those are all increased if someone has BV. Um, and persistence of HPV and even high-grade dysplasia is increased um, with BV. So that's one you really do want to try to get rid of. Uncomplicated is pretty straightforward. Most people just use flagyl metronidazole. And... Um, you take it uh, twice a day for seven days. You can do it vaginally. Metrogel is five, gra five grams vaginally every night for um, five days. Um, tinidazole is an alternative to metronidazole. And um, the alternative for vaginal treatment is clindamycin, which comes in three different formulations. Um, the problem with that is that's going to kill off a lot of your normal vaginal organisms too. So I don't usually go to that as my first choice. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people will have a recurrence within 12 months. And the first time they recur, it's not such a big deal. You can use the same treatment and it will often work. But you can't use it over and over and over again because there is resistance that develops after a few courses of metronidazole. And after you've used it four times or you've used clindamycin four times, um, they're just not going to work. So you can try other things or you can alternate them if you have recurrences. And that's because it's a disruption of the vaginal microbiome that really um, is the underlying problem with um, bacterial vaginosis. Um, and this, there's a biofilm that's produced by Gardnerella 
that seems to be involved with this disease and its persistence and recurrence. Um, preliminary research is showing some um, benefit with vaginal lactobacillus crispitus for prevention um, and following um, treatment with metronidazole, but that's not totally um, demonstrated yet. Um, it can be sexually transmitted. Um, it isn't helpful to treat male partners, but you can consider use of condoms for a few months um, and cleaning of shared sex toys is important too. So for pers persistent disease, um, these are a couple of protocols. There, there aren't any good um, studies with head-to-head -head comparisons of these different ways of treating recurrent vaginitis. So you're really kind of on your own to pick and choose. Um, it's also worth noting that um, it, it, there's a high rate of yeast co-infection with these so that you may end up treating both things at once. Um, again, if you're using metronidazole orally, the boric acid capsules can be really helpful. They're gonna knock out yeast and they're very good for BV. Um, unfortunately, there is a significant percentage of people who will have another recurrence within, within six months. Um, here's some other alternatives you can use for uh, recurrent disease. Um, this desquilinum um, is not available in this country, but it is available in Canada and Europe if people have access to pharmacies there. And that seems to have quite good results. Now we're moving on to trichomoniasis. Um, symptoms of that can be quite minimal, but, or they can include a wide range of different problems, including the discharge, the odor, the itching. This is the one where you can get uh, dysuria because the urethra is infected in about 90% of women with this disease. You can get dyspareunia and you can get some postcoital bleeding. Um, the discharge can be clear and hardly noticeable, or it can be yellow, green, and frothy. Um, there's often a malodor, but not as much as with BV. Some erythema, occasionally some punctate uh, lesions on the vagina and the cervix. Um, but as I said, on the microscope with saline, you see the organisms and you have your diagnosis. pH is high. And um, you can always send the, the uh, molecular panels if you're not sure what you're dealing with. Pap smear, as with BV, is unreliable. Don't treat the results of a pap smear. Now, worldwide, trick is the most common STI. And this is the one where male partners have to be treated. Um, not everybody is going to have symptoms, so this can last for a long time. I think my record was um, an older woman, about 68, who'd been widowed for five years, and I totally believe her when she said she was celibate and she had trick. It's, it is more common in older women. Yeast is more common in reproductive age women. Trick is more common in older women and women of color. Um, and again, if you have BV, you're more likely to acquire uh, trick. It, it also increases the risk of acquiring and spreading HIV and other STIs. It, um, that would be by two or three times. Um, it increases the risk of infertility and of adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, uncomplicated is pretty easy to treat. Uh, metronidazole is what most people use. It's a one-time dose of four 500 milligram tablets to the patient and to the partner. Um, 
many states will allow you to write a prescription for both um, when you're seeing the woman. Um, and the cure rate is pretty high. The cure rate is even a little higher with tinidazole. Um, it's the same directions for taking it. Uh, we used to say no alcohol with metronidazole, but that's been debunked. People are still saying no alcohol with tinidazole. Um, the no sex for a week, nice, can't rely on getting that. You should retest people after three months because 20% uh, will be reinfected. Uh, the usual reason for recurrence is the partner hasn't taken medications. So I usually tell patients, give him his pills, you or her, your, his, her pills, have your pills, both of you take them at once. Um, and oftentimes there is another sexual partner unknown to your patient who isn't getting treated. And then the treatment of just two people isn't going to last. There's very low resistance to these medications. Um, but there can be um, allergy. So with recurrence, you can use uh, the metronidazole um, just like you would for um, BV um, twice a day for a week, or you can use a little higher dose once a day for a week. Same thing with tinidazole. You do the higher dose daily for a week. Um, if you add peril I can I don't know if I can say this, paramycin um, to the tinidazole, um, and that's given vaginally for two weeks. Um, that's even more effective, but that's kind of a high-end specialized treatment. That By the time you're going to get to that, you will have done um, a trick culture, which has to be sent through the uh, CDC or your state lab, it, and you've consulted an ID person. If there does seem to be an allergy, you can desensitize them and continue to use metronidazole. Okay, so those are the main um, ones that we know clearly an infectious cause. Now moving on to a couple of more, and do we have any other questions there, Jennifer, that you wanted to bring up? Yes, we have one more. Uh huh. When pap smears offer to test for STI, including TRIC, should we rely on these results for TRIC? I think you have to know how they're doing it. If you're sending a liquid prep and they're using a, nu a nucleic acid amplification or a PCR to test for TRIC, then I would rely on it. If they're using cytology, I would not. Cytology is not a reliable way to diagnose trick. Okay, moving on to atrophic vaginitis. Now the PC way to refer to that is, is genitourinary syndrome of menopause. But of course, you don't have to be in menopause, you just have to have low estrogen. So by history, um, there's going to be dryness, irritation, itching. You can have uh, pain with intercourse, pain with urination, some urgent continence, spotting, all those th things are part of this syndrome. On exam, as I showed you earlier, the vagina is smooth without the folds that you would usually see. And there's a little bit of clear or white discharge. Um, unlike um, other menopausal symptoms, this does not get better with age. In fact, the older you get, the more likely you are to have this. Uh, it affects about 50% of women at some point in their lives. And of these, only 7% uh, receive treatment because most of us, as we get older, think a whole lot of things are just due to getting older and we have no choice but to live with them. So for your older women, you can ask about this and do a lot of good. Dr. Lister, a couple more questions. Sure. When complicated trick infections that mm -hmm. have recurred multiple times over many years, does that equal, is there another alternative to the Tina dissolve? Sorry, I don't know how to say it. Um, with, with, is complicated trick? Complicated trick is rare. 
it's usually because there are sexual partners that somebody doesn't know about. Um, and that's the most common reason. Occasionally, um, there can be resistant organisms, but that is so rare that they are not going to let you or me order that. You have to get an ID consult, and they have to send uh, a sample through at least the, the State Department of Public Health or the CDC to find out for sure what's going on. And they may have to uh, desensitize someone to metronidazole so that you can use the higher doses. Okay. She, al she also put, patient is not sexually active for over two years, but continues to have finding on wet mount periodically, has failed oh. multiple metronidazole and the tenidazole so, yeah. treatment courses over multiple years, was referred to gynecologist, but unable to get there due to insurance challenges. Hmm. And, and the trick has been diagnosed either by wet prep or by one of the... Um, vaginal panel swabs. With that, I would go for an ID consult. If you're absolutely sure that there's no sharing of sex toys, no sexual partners whatsoever over these two years when she's been treated multiple times, then that warrants an ID consult. And luckily for you, we have lots of good ID people at Maven. You can just write them a little note and they'll give you advice to where to go from there. That's what I would do. You have another question in there, Jennifer? No, no, that's it, Jessica. If that answers your question, or let me know if you want me to unmute you and if you wanted to. Ask well, we'll anything. mute you at the end, Jennifer. If if okay. if I didn't answer that adequately, but I don't think I have any more wisdom to share on that. Okay, so, she said it's great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, back to treating the uh, atrophic vaginitis. The main thing is you got to use estrogen cream, and or not estrogen cream, vaginal estrogen, either as a cream. Uh, tablets, or um, there's a little, um, I think it's silicone ring that you could put in the vagina. It's good for three months. Um, the hard part with both the ring and the tablets is remembering to do it twice a week, which I can tell you from experience is a hard regimen to keep up. Um, and the cream is also really messy the next day. Um, so I personally like the ring. The problem is many insurances do not cover it. So then you're, you're stuck with tablets, probably your next best bet or the cream. The cream's pretty is the cheapest. Um, and it will, it will definitely work. Um, also use of, oh, and back on the vaginal estrogen, people can use that even if they've had breast cancer, even if they've had uterine cancer, um, there's almost nothing that precludes use of vaginal estrogen. You can have gallbladder disease, you can have a history of DVT, all those things that would preclude systemic estrogen do not apply for vaginal estrogen. Unfortunately, in the package, the manufacturer will put a piece of paper that'll say people with all these things shouldn't be using this product, and it's because they haven't differentiated systemic from vaginal. So you have to tell people up front, don't read that package insert because um, it is all right for you. If you have any doubts about that, somebody who's currently being treated for breast cancer, you can call their oncologist and see what they say. There are also over-the-counter uh, vaginal moisturizers and lubricants. And then these should be used during intercourse. Um, I'm not convinced they work real well, just day in, day out, um, but definitely use with intercourse. Um, I don't have much experience with the DEA vaginal inserts because I'm a big fan of vaginal estrogen, so I hardly use anything else. But supposedly they can help. Testosterone probably would help, but it's not FDA approved. And now there's this new product called ospimaphine, which is an oral product that is supposed to also be helpful. I have no experience with it. Um, I think this is our last one, disquamative inflammatory vaginitis. We don't really know what causes that, but um, many times you will find staph aureus or a group A strep, and that is thought to be associated. 
It's characterized by, and it can come in any age from young teenagers right on up, characterized by loss of normal flora and a marked increase in inflammation. Um, so when you have persistent vaginitis, you have to think of this one because it, it accounts for 8% of, of uh, persistent recurrent vaginitis. Um, these people have burning and uh, severe dyspareunia if they're sexually active. They do have discharge. On the exam, um, there's a lot of introidal erythema and vaginal erythema and petechiae. There's a lot of discharge, yellow-brown, but no odor. pH is usually high, often over six. And on the microscopic exam, as I showed you at the beginning, there are lots and lots of white cells and parabasal cells. Um, you can do vaginal CNS. This is not a CNS for yeast. This is just a regular bacterial aerobic CNS. And you may find the uh, strep or the staph, which is kind of um, confirming or strengthening you, your belief that this, this is what's going on. Um, you can do the molecular test, but you should not find any uh, yeast trick or um, bacterial veg Gardnerella bacterial vaginosis. You're doing the, the molecular test as kind of a rule out. Um, and I probably would do GC and chlamydia just because you want to make sure you're not missing that. Now, treatment is with um, steroid suppositories um, or vaginal cream. Um, a vaginal cream, again, is probably a little messier. It has to be done for weeks. Um, and you can also use, I uh, probably would do this, especially if I had a positive culture, you can use clindamycin. Um, but again, you're using it for three to six weeks and it, it isn't gonna help you reestablish normal flora in there. And I, I, I should add, when we're talking about bacterial vaginosis or this disease where the flora is really disrupted, um, people have tried things like the, um, probiotics, prebiotics, whatever they are, those um, capsules that are supposed to have nice lactobacilli in them. And the results are not impressive, uh, either given orally or given vaginally. So don't waste your time and your patient's money on that one. Um, you can consider vaginal estrogen because that does help the vaginal flora, except, except for yeast, but everything else, it helps. And um, you can do that during the treatment with the steroids, or you can do it after. Um, a lot of times with these uh, medications that you're using, using steroids, maybe we're using antibiotics, maybe using estrogen, it's kind of a setup for yeast. So you may want to give some diflucan uh, at the same time you do the other ones. Um, and you follow these people with the pH and mic microscopy, um, more than half will require a maintenance treatment that goes on for up to six months and sometimes even longer. So we're going back now just for a minute to our what to do questions. Um, the 4 p.m. call from the established patient with itchy vaginal discharge. Just go ahead and raise your hand or put in the chat. What do you think she has and what are you going to do about it? Don't be shy. There's more than one right answer. See any yet? Hmm? I don't see anybody responding yet. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just give you my take on it then. Um, I would, I think if you want to, you can have this person come in and um, do a, a, a swab themselves. You can just take the swab from one of the vaginitis panels, send them into the bathroom, tell them to put it up like a tampon, twirl it around a couple of times, give it back to you. Um, that's helpful if whatever else you tell them to do doesn't work. 
You can, of course, tell them to use the vulvar treatment on the outside and come back and see you next week. I would not see this person on a Friday afternoon in my office. I would be, before I do that, I would give them a Diflucan um, um, over the phone and tell them to come back next week um, if it's not better. The nice thing about doing that is Diflucan is not going to interfere with your ability to diagnose something else. If they use the over-the-counter meds, that will, because you're still going to have stuff in the vagina that they put in by buying something over the counter. So, um, so someone did respond, wet mount, wet mount and yeah. call for Diflucan. That's because you're probably in that clinic that has the MAs doing the wet mount. And that's great if you can do it. I think that's probably um, the best. But I didn't have that. And, and I got to the point I was very willing to uh, call in Diflucan if it wasn't a recurrent problem. Okay, going to the next one, the 36-year-old with multiple episodes of vaginitis. I hate this because lots of times um, clinicians will just treat over the phone or um, have somebody come in and treat without waiting for labs or wet prep results. And they'll always be treating for the same thing, or they'll treat for sometimes a BV and the rest of the time for yeast, but they don't really know what's going on. And that's very frustrating because then you have to say, back up, we're going to get this solved, but I need you to come in and see me every time you have these symptoms. And then I would do for somebody like that, the first time I would just do the wet prep. If I didn't see anything, I would send a swab. I would consider sending a, a GC chlamydia test. Um, and then um, if I still didn't know, I would have them wait um, until I got the test results back. It's only a day for a swab. Um, so wait for that if you don't know and really give them the good pep talk about they have to come back to let you get to know them over time. We do oh. have a couple people that answered in the chat, Dr. Lister. Good. Let me see what you had to say. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they definitely need to be seen. That's why I said this is an office visit. Um, yep, and we're on the same board. Yep, I think we're all in agreement about that. Um, then the last one was the phone Oh, call. sorry, Dr. Lister, someone just asked a question. Okay, yep. Do you ever treat male or female sexual partners if BV Canada is positive? Oh, um, is it going? Would I ever treat partners for BV? Yes. If female partners, definitely. Um, male partners, you know, there's not great evidence that that helps anything, but if you're into the recurrent BV, you might try it once to see. Be sure that any shared sex toys are being adequately cleaned um, between use. And I don't think I don't think that there are great algorithms. I see that um, one of the good ID um, people is on this. Uh, this uh, webinar, so maybe he can give a comment too at the end or now. Um, but I don't think they're great algorithms for how to treat people with recurrence, persistence of these problems. So I think within the bounds of what I've tried to give you today, you have some leeway for clinical judgment and thinking, you know, well, I'm going to try this. And it's not crazy to do that. Um, Hunter, did you want to add to that? Maybe not. Well, if you do, let Jennifer know. Um, the final one, patient with the atrophic vaginitis. Um, the thing I would add to this, um, I would not do anything over the phone for this person. I do think she has to come in for an exam. And you go through the whole thing of the wet prep and, if necessary, um, a swab. Um, I would also do uh, a urine um, urinalysis and CNS because 
that's part of her complaints and uh, pretty common with older people. Um, and then we talked about the treatments with um, estrogen primarily and with over-the-counter lubricants for intercourse. Now, I am open for questions about these people or any others that you would like to talk about. Dr. Lister, Hunter did want to speak. Hunter, I did unmute you. You should be able to. Yeah, oh, no, only thanks for the invitation. I, I was just going to say that no studies have unfortunately shown any partner treatment for women with BV makes any difference in the women's recurrence, BV recurrence uh, rate. I think an important aspect is that, as you've suggested, the sexual transmission issues on BV are further complicated because BV is often more common in women who have gonorrhea, chlamydia, maybe mycoplasma genitalium and others. So in women with BV, always test for other STIs. And then that may dictate partner treatment, of course, but BV per se, unfortunately, difficult, uh, uh, difficult to know and, and no well, good data to support you, it. You agree you would treat women partners, but not men. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, it, it is fascinating. The whole notion about sexual transmission is not in doubt <laughs> among lesbian women. It, it, no. My close colleague, Dr. Ginny Marazzo, who has just become the head of National Institute of Virology and Infectious Diseases, she has replaced Anthony Fauci. And she, in her experience studying this beginning 30 years ago, she has never seen a woman, a lesbian woman with a female partner who had BV in which the partner was not, did not also have BV. It is universal and female partners of women with BV definitely always need treatment. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I see a question. Does atrophic vaginitis reverse if treated for short-term hyperestrogenic states, i.e. postpartum? Um, yeah, people. I think people can wait for their own estrogen to come back. But if somebody is going to be nursing for a long time, some of their estrogen will come back, but not necessarily all of it. If they still have symptoms after this, their uh, month or six week visit, I would treat them. Um, and that, but those those changes for temporary loss of estrogen um, will reverse. They'll reverse with treatment. They'll reverse if you get your own estrogen back. More questions, folks. I would. Um, just like to say we're all so appreciative of the work you're doing and um we want to help and support you in any way we can um oh i think there's somewhere around mm, seven to ten gynecologists available on maven and you should feel very free to put questions into us and we'll get back to you usually quite quickly dr lister someone deborah just commented, I have a transgender male with a monkeypox badge. Vaginitis. <laughs> Oy. Um, that I would defer to Hunter. Um, I think that that's, you know, that's a new thing to me. And I am not an expert in treating monkeypox. I would ask an ID person. Hunter says, yes, it's been reported. What to do about it? I don't know. Well, monkeypox treatment is a uh, is a little bit. Uh, there's a drug called tecuvirabat, which is recommended to treat monkeypox. The data on how well it actually works are pretty marginal, uh, but it's uh, it is available. It's an antiviral drug, and uh, CDC recommends routine use in every case. But uh, how helpful it actually is, particularly if someone's already had symptoms for several days and maybe starting to get better spontaneously. But it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult area. But do be aware of in sexually active, mostly men having sex with men, also transgenders and so on. That monkeypox is an additional cause of genital ulcer disease and uh, and uh, genital pustules and so on. Not totally unlike herpes, although there's differences as well. But just keep it in mind. It is a miserable disease to live through. And and if someone has HIV or is otherwise uh, severely immunodepressed, they can get terrible disease. Uh, there have been cases of people losing 
uh, entire noses, ears, uh, and genital components due to ulceration and sloughing. It's a bad, bad disease in people with immunodeficiency. So the, uh, a person says he does, this person does have HIV. So I would assume you'd want to get an infectious disease person involved if you can. Absolutely, I would. Okay, anything else? Anyone wants to ask, we're at the end of the hour and I thank you all for your, your attention and I hope this has been helpful. Yes, and I just want to re remind you that the CME survey will appear in a tab when you close out this webinar. So we really appreciate you taking the few minutes to complete this. Not only does this give you CME credit, but also helps us to plan the best session for you. We share the feedback anonymously with the speakers and they greatly appreciate your thoughts. And thank you so much, Dr. Lister. And thank you, Dr. <laughs> thank you, Hunter Hansfield too. <laughs>